now we have a really a special treat to kick off the conference, um, the dialogue between Ilya Mihav and Jean-Paul Kopi. I'll call Ilian up to introduce this. Just a few words about Ilian. Um, a very, very accomplished macroeconomist, um, student of Ben Bernanke's, many, many influential articles, over 4,000 citations, which believe me is a lot, a lot, and at the same time incredibly effective at communicating on macroeconomics, often hosting and appearing on CNBC, Squawk Box, and other outlets. Ilian, all yours. glad to see many of my former students here, current students. Whenever I get in front of my students, I feel I need my PowerPoint presentation jumping up and down, but today we'll do something different. We're really honored to have Jean-Francois Coupe with us today to discuss uh, the views that we have, he has on European competitiveness, on the development in France, and what, how we can imagine the future of Europe going forward. I think Jean-Francois Coupet does not need introduction. Um, most of you, I'm sure that all of you know him quite well. He has achieved, however, so many things that if you have to introduce him, you need more than 20 minutes. I just want to say that when I was reading his CV, it's amazing that one person can be in business, you know, working with companies, with banks, then can be an academic teaching economics, uh, the most interesting science, of course, of all, and then be a politician, and that is to be a very successful politician. He is currently the Secretary General of UMP, the party that is in opposition, and, uh, the strongest opposition party, and uh, he's also the mayor of Mons, so he has an executive role, he has uh, an executive role in the party, but he's also a legislature, a legislator, member of parliament, and uh, I have no idea how he manages you know, to balance all these things. Uh, Jean-François Coupé was in Singapore about three or four months ago, so we met there for the first time. I listened to some of his remarks, and I must say that uh, it was quite remarkable. It was very interesting for an academic, for an economist, to listen to a politician who actually has very similar views to what I have as an academic or an economist. And uh, at, the, at the end of the day, when I was listening to this, I was thinking, I personally, so that's my personal statement, that's for the press, I think that in 2017 we'll have Monsieur Coupe as the next president of France. I certainly hope so. Thank you very much. Please welcome Monsieur Coupe. Seller. <laughs> um, selling good things. It's, 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 it's a pleasure for me and a great honor to be back, as I can say. In INSEAD, you, you remember, uh, again, we were together four months ago in Singapore. Uh, at that time, Sarkozy was president, UNP was the majority. Today, it's a bit darker for us. <laughs> um, I want to start maybe this short introduction by a very short story. A week ago, just before the beginning of the European Council, I was in Brussels, sitting with all my colleagues um, in the European Parliament Party, Popular Party, sorry, who uh, gather all the leaders, uh, the majority of the, or the opposition, but coming from the right or center, center right. And we're there, many personalities coming from all the countries and of course Angela Merkel but also Jean-Claude Juncker, Herman Van Rompuy, Michel Barnier and so on. And we had a very interesting discussion about the future of Europe. And it was very interesting to see that uh, in the first part of the meeting our Italian, Spanish, Greek, Portuguese friends were talking about only one issue, the way for them to solve the very short-term problem of the debt and financing of the, of the banking sector. And at one time, Angela Merkel said, you know, all this is 
of course, a priority for us. We have to find a solution. But please, the future of Europe is remaining in one word, imagination. And then in the part where I was sitting, a colleague of mine, I think he was coming from Hungary now, I think, said to me, what means imagination? We are working very hard to find a solution just now. And I said, well, I don't know, imagination? Well, maybe this is the best definition of competitiveness. And I think it is probably the best definition of competitiveness. And according to me, as we have to face all these challenges coming from everywhere at the same time, and all these different types of crises that we have to face, I mean, I think that the, the most important challenge for us is competitiveness. That's why I think the, 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 the title of this conference is the best one uh, to know. Um, first of all, let's remind that um, the economic crisis has really shown that by increasing the deficits to limit the repercussion of the crisis, we have reached a dead end. We know that, we were telling about that uh, years after years, but our continent, Europe, hasn't taken the, uh, the decision that, that we had to make in order to uh, inverse this situation. And the crisis that we have we are face, been facing now for five years forces us to rethink our logic in an open economy artificially, and I say artificially stimulating the purchasing power doesn't lead to the development of a sustainable growth. This, we know that. We learn it in all our books of economy. But even if we know the theory, nobody in the political field was able to take into account this reality. And I think this is probably the most important weakness of the politic decision-making in Europe. And this makes a big difference with the other areas. Competitiveness is, of course, the key. And according to me, it's the new frontier for Europe. And it's probably the only one. That's why, when I hear lots of decision-makers coming from every country in Europe, saying to the people, the only thing we have to do is to reduce public debt by reduce public deficit. I say, of course, but if you just say that, it's not enough to bring the people to coach us, to go with us for this uh, challenge. Because people are getting afraid about that. What means for the, the daily life of, life of a citizen coming from France, from Italy, even from Germany or Austria, what does it mean for him to reduce public spending? What would be the way for him with a, a short wage to, uh, to bring his children to build their life, you know? And this is much more difficult in an old continent than our continent, than, for instance, when you see what is the pragmatism in the United States or even in, in Asia. And this makes a real difference. We have to face a very multi-faceted crisis. A debt crisis, a confidence crisis, an economic crisis, a banking crisis. I mean, you know, it's very heavy. Very heavy. Of course, we know that we are responsible for all that because of all these decisions that we should have done and that we haven't made. That's true. But then, when you have said that, what is the, the, the next step? And the next step, of course, as usual, is to uh, put in the table three key issues. First of all, the prerequisite, the precondition, is to stabilize the financial sector. Because we know that all the eyes in the world, and of course in Europe, are focused on this short-term question. When I say short-term, of course I know that it's not a short-term question. I know that it's the future of our capacity to finance economy. But I say short-term because I feel like the fact that when you have to, to, to find a very short-term solution, a very short-term answer, to a very, very huge problem, you are not able to see what's, what's next. And this means that it's the uh, opposite of, of the, the serenity, the lucidity that you need 
to make good political decisions in a real strategic plan. But anyway, the priority, of course, is to stabilize the financial sector. But it's also to face two other major points, which is, first of all, to, to, to limit our public spending, which is a real revolution in Europe, a real revolution. And second, of course, to rebuild the new conditions of a competitiveness. Let's say just a word about the financial sector. What happened last week in the European Council was good, of course. We knew, all of us, that we had to find a short-term solution for the, uh, the debt in, in Italy and in Spain. And what happened, according to me, was the best thing that could happen. A single rule book, a unified banking crisis resolution system, and the coordinated insurance mechanism in the banking industry. And according to me, this was a real priority, because nobody was ready to do any other thing and to put any other issue on the table before getting a solution to this question. Once this unique monitoring system is implemented, the ESM should have the possibility of directly recapitalizing banks, and of course this will relieve states from the burden of additional debts emerging from attempts to save banks. And according to me, despite Germany's previous reservations, this, the ESM will have the opportunity of intervening in the primary market, in addition to the secondary market, and I think this was the best thing that we could realize last week. But then, by saying that, we all know that the real issue for us is our relation with public spending and deficits. As Thierry Breton is here, we were together in the government. It was another time when public debt was being reduced and, and, and we were reducing taxes, public spending. Well, you know, he was very good, Thierry. <laughs> <laughs> we, can we can do it again, no problem. <laughs> it would be very useful to do it now. But it's not exactly what's oriented now, Mr. Hollande. But then what happened? Uh, we had, uh, at that time, did a, we, we did a great effort to uh, bring our public opinion to the idea that there were no other uh, solution for us than to reduce public spending, more than public debt, because the real problem for us is to make pedagogy. It's to explain that we can do better with less. But in, in Europe in general, not only in France, in Europe in general, we have always the same problem with the public opinion. You know, when you go to a rally, a political rally, you are running for being elected, and you are in the right wing, rather than in the left wing, you say to the people, you can vote for me, I'm going to decrease taxes. Now, people say, well, great. They don't believe you, but, you know, they <laughs> That's when you say, afterwards, but if I decrease taxes, I have to decrease public spending. Usually, half of the people stop applauding, just waiting the end of the, of the sentence. And then when you say, for instance, maybe we could stop, stop reduce the number of students in, in the classroom, you know, because at the end of the day, we will have one, one student for one teacher. So I think maybe uh, 20, 25 students, it's enough. Usually, or when you say, oh, at the same time, maybe we can gather uh, two hospitals that are very close the one to the other, maybe to make sort of uh, economies. Then, you know, you are always someone in the, in the room who say, okay, you do whatever you want, but not in the classroom of my son, and not in the hospital of my city, you see? Because I want them to be kept. And this is the real dilemma of all political decision makers. And we have been defeated one month ago. We have been defeated, not only on this issue, but especially in this one. At the same time, François Hollande has launched for France a program which is exactly the opposite. Unfortunately, um, he stopped the program of reduction of public spendings. He burdened the cost of labor by imposing a tax on additional work hours. He removed the value-added tax on 
uh, anti delocalization way to reduce social charges on labor in order to reduce the cost of labor in France and to reinforce competitiveness. And he shattered the retirement reform, the pension system reform. So that's why we are worrying now. Because, according to me, there is no efficient European governance if there is no very close link between France and Germany. And this is, of course, for us the main challenge. And that's why the talks between Angela Merkel and François Hollande are so tough at this moment. Because in order to reduce the government spendings, we know that we cannot increase the number of civil servants. We know that we have to reorganize the public administration. And when you have a look to what happens in Europe, even in Italy or in Spain, there is a great effort that is now made to reduce public spending. I don't know the end of the story. I know that the Italian public opinion or Spanish uh, public opinion is worrying, of course. And we know that the, the unpopularity of Mr. Monti or Mr. Rajoy is real. But at the same time, I know that we in France have to do that too. And it's not the case now. The last point of my introduction is to say a word about competitiveness. According to me, the only way for us, I mean politically, to convince people, to convince the public opinion, to accept a reduction of public spending is to make sure that they are okay with the capacity for us to bring our economy to competitiveness. And that's why I try every day to talk about the German example. Because we know, all of us, that is the only way to restore competitiveness in our continent. And we see now, and that's my, the, the main problem for us, that there are now two behaviors. The behaviors of the country that are totally uh, conscious that they have to take into account the question of competitiveness, which means um, to reduce um, public spendings, of course, but also to make sure that there is a new flexibility in the labor legislation, that you can modernize uh, the social system, and you can implement structural reforms. And the other part is coming from countries that are not able to do it, because politically the public opinion is not ready to do it. And this needs, of course, a real pedagogy. And this is exactly the key issue for us now, because this means that first of all, we have to uh, reform totally the, legi the labor legislation, and we have keys to do it, even in a European context. We have to uh, develop investment and innovation, which also will play a major role. And according to me, the French legislation for research and innovation uh, is very um, efficient, and it would be a pity to put that away, and I hope we will keep it on. And then, of course, we have to develop the, uh, the, the small and medium enterprises as the Germans are doing it, because we know that it's a way to orient the, the, the growth towards innovation, investment, and exports, and not anymore on domestic consumption, because, of course, this needs more public spending, and we have the means for that. So according to me, we do have the keys to do the job. It will be very difficult, mainly because of a question of mentality, much more than about the real economy, because we know everywhere that we have the good universities, the good professional training, the good means to do that. But the problem now is to make sure that we can organize a European strategy. And this is my last word before answering questions. According to me, we will have two kinds of problems. The first one is a question of governance. Maybe we'll have questions on this, on this point, but the question of European governance cannot be put in the table with all concepts. The question of a federal Europe, according to me, is totally outdated. The problem is not to dream about what could be the United States of Europe. Each continent has its own history. So according to me, what is important is how to build a Europe that could be efficient. The efficiency should be the key word. 
And we are losing too many times by talking about institutions, about constitutions. At, that, at each time, there are many discussions. And these discussions are you know, not adapted to the capacity for us to be much uh, quicker on decision making. And my last word is to say that we need uh, a strategic vision. And according to me, this strategic vision is not really clear. Because each state has its own strategy, its own problem, its own level of development. And of course, this is in contradiction with what could be a European strategy. So we need a leadership. And this leadership, according to me, cannot be implemented if there is no very strong link between France and Germany. Because it represents half of the GDP of the Eurozone and that everybody knows that it's exactly in this link that we can settle a new strategic vision. So according to me, this is a worrying problem when I see the French new government so far from the priorities of Europe and of Germany. Thank you very much. time for some questions. Uh, I had prepared two questions, a difficult one and an easy one. But uh, you know, given that there is very little time, I know that Mr. Copé is pressured for time, I'll start with a difficult question, because these questions are not interesting. And then I'll open it to the floor for other ones. Um, you were talking about public spending and uh, the issue with the government spending overall. One of the proposals that is sitting out there is uh, Europe uh, with united fiscal policy, with fiscal union. So we can start even with a fiscal compact, your view on the fiscal compact and the idea of a fiscal union. And then we'll take questions from that. Well, you know, the, the question is difficult. It's not difficult technically. It's politically difficult. Because according to me, talking about convergence in tax policy today, uh, it's just talking about nothing. Uh, we had this very interesting discussion a year ago. And we had a strategy plan that has been implemented by uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and Angela Merkel with one goal. Make sure that within two or three years, our two countries, our two economies, could really bring themselves to a real convergence in tax policy. And that's why, for instance, um, Sarkozy had launched the idea um, of um, a very tough reduction of um, the corporation taxes, the company's taxes. But then, I can't tell about that now, because as you know, the program of Hollande is at the total opposite. Uh, we had a very interesting and, and sad discussion on the French Parliament two days ago, as the new Prime Minister told us what's the program for taxes. And, well, my opinion, my intuition is that they won't be able to go very far on, that, on this direction, which means increasing taxes for corporate, for, for companies, increased taxes for people, and, and no reduction of public spending. I mean, this is no way I know about that. But, the problem is that everything's are getting much faster today than 30 years ago. When Mitterrand was elected, it was in 1981, he made two years of stupidity. And after the end of the second year, he said, okay, stop. We change everything. We are going to, he said, a realistic left policy, which means a, a right policy. <laughs> 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 In the same deadlock today, the, the only difference is that 30 years ago, two years of, of stupidities, it was all right. Uh, today, two hours of stupidities is very expensive So, because of the market. So I don't really know when all this fiesta is going to stop. But I cannot, I cannot talk about convergence in tax policy today. It's impossible. Unfortunately, it's impossible. Okay, well, let's open the floor for some questions. Uh, there is a question here. I don't know whether these microphones are working. Oh, no, there is the one that is moving. Uh, you stated that you are not in favor of the idea of moving forward for a federal Europe, the United States of Europe. Can you explain why? And we... Can I ask most of the... 
you'll present yourself. Yes, so I'm, I'm Ulysses Kyriakopoulos, I'm an alumni of 77. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, head of the Greek uh, Patrona and uh, quite involved in European affairs. I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm not in favor. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful dream. But I just say that if to reach this goal, we lose years and years and years and years without any kind of other decisions, we will be inefficient. And at the same time, many of our fellow citizens will say, we are fed up with Europe. You know, we shouldn't underestimate uh, what happens when there are elections everywhere in the country in Europe. Uh, the increase of extremism everywhere, not only in France, in your country, and in other countries too. This means something. I mean, the Euroscepticism is not only the philosophy of David Cameron. <laughs> Let's be conscious about that. So, according to me, what people are wondering is only to know if we are able to bring efficiency in Europe. On, pol on public policies, immigration, uh, money, economy, trade, uh, corporate settlements, and so on. I mean, this is today uh, the main issue. If we talk about federalism, this means that we are going again to put around the table 27 head of states in order to say, so, what are we going to do in order to think about uh, Washington, uh, Johnson, uh, Benjamin Franklin, and so on? You know, sorry about that. I mean, it's a dream for everybody here. But then, if we're not able to do it, if we, if we uh, lose again 10 years, 20 years on this question, remember what happened to Amsterdam Treaty? Uh, you know, remember all this story, you see? So, as I am deeply European, you know, really, uh, I think that we have to take into account the public opinion. They want us to be efficient. They are worrying about the increase of communitarism, of integrism. They are worrying about the question of security. Uh, really, this is the about immigration. So, you know, today we have to be very cautious with the increase of extremism that are all defending an ID which is against the Europe and against Europe. You see, so I think what is more efficient is to talk about um, uh, priorities in public, um, uh, it's to define, sorry, public priorities. What could be the Europe of immigration? Who is going to do it together? Who is going to work together? And I think this is much efficient. Thank you. There is another question here. Where's the microphone? Excuse me. Yeah, no, no, I'm the, uh, the head of strategy, yes, and if you best serve, frankly, now part of the opposition. Um, the, um, you talk about efficiency, and you know, we in companies are used to doing things that, that uh, the governments are doing straight up on investment and looking for efficiencies for the sake of our uh, uh, shareholders. But we are not subject to the vagaries of elections and public movement. So how do you have your own shareholders too? Right. <laughs> the, how how do you reconcile this search of efficiency with the public opinion, and how much of the current ownership or accountability of the states would you be recommending is abandoned to a European level? Well, this question is a, a very important and very difficult one because we. As we are all citizens in this in this room, we have all our own opinion. This is the beginning of my answer. As you can imagine, what is difficult for us is to bring our public opinions to uh, a global strategy, a global vision. And it's very difficult because, as you know, the, the leaders of each country doesn't have the total hand to decide. And lots of them, and it was not very bold, we're saying to the people, sorry, this decision is not because of me, because of Brussels. And years after years, we had this problem to face, because then the public opinion said, okay, so we don't want any more about Brussels. We don't want to hear about that. These are technocrats. And nobody's right, nobody's wrong, you know? So, according to me, what is now very important is to promote this idea of the Europe of pioneers. You see, the, uh, the Europe of circles. 
I think there are things that can be done by everybody at the same time, because we are professional on this question. Agriculture, um, trade, um, or whatever. You know, we have many fields where we can work all together, harmonization of deep loans or so on. But then, in new policies, or the policies that we have to uh, upgrade, like for instance the question of immigration, or money, on the other hand, I think it's much better to organize things with a few number of countries and then say, okay, we're successful, you can come. You see? Because this is probably the key of efficiency. Of course, it's a, a very original model. Usually, as Cartesians, European citizens, we like things that are very clear. First step, then second step, and so on. But let's be frank. The differences between countries in Europe are huge. What are the common points because between countries coming from the west side or the east side? Only the political will to stay in the same continent, to have the same organization, the same parliament, the same president maybe. But then, even if we settle these kind of institutions, we know that we do have to make more in efficiency for public policies. And this is the main challenge according to me. This is the main challenge. And that's why the, the European councils that we are all living from our TV are very interesting. But at each time, it's very, very small steps. Very small. And this means that, according to me, the only way to bring people to believe again, to trust again in the future, is to talk about competitiveness. Not with graphs, not with figures, but with human beings. Saying, this is the way to use what is be the best in Europe. And what is the best in Europe? It's the people, the European genius, you see? And they, according to me, this is probably the way to, to bring them to a new strategic vision. Thank you. Do we have uh, time for two more questions? Okay. okay. Let's have a couple of questions here in the front. Well, uh, my name is Marina Lipomis. I'm the Managing Director of the American Chamber of Commerce here in France. And my question relates to um, your argument regarding perhaps a contradiction between a uh, federal Europe and the dream and the argument of efficiency. And I would like to sort of take it back in the sense of this being a particularly economic argument. Will we be uh, efficient in constructing a global economic power uh, in Europe? and asserting our competitiveness without having a much larger circle. Because right now, our attractiveness is based on 27 countries, the consumer market that represents, etc. We're talking about um, uh, a free trade agreement, possibly with the US. We're talking about leveraging the entire 27. So I understand the <coughs> argument about disparities, but the US also has great disparities between Mississippi and Massachusetts. So. Will we be able to assert our, our, let's say, road to competitiveness without tackling some issues like deepening the signal market and doing that throughout the 27? Thank you. I think federal Europe will happen once. I, I do agree with you. It's a sort of, uh, it's, it, it's the ultimate goal. But I just want to, to bring you to the idea that the history of these two continents are deeply different. It's easier to build a, a federal state when you are built something from nothing. <laughs> Sorry about that again, but who <laughs> was, was, was Mississippi uh, in uh, the, uh, the beginning of the 19th century? How was it? Many people were living there? What about Colorado? How was it organized at that time? It was not very difficult to build step after step what could be a federal state. And even with that, remember a terrible war in the 60s, okay? In the 1960s. The problem of Europe is that, you know, it's not, it's, it's not a, a white uh, sheep with nothing in. Uh, think only about the question of egocentrism, the problem of being a head of state. You don't imagine how it's difficult to become the president of your country. <laughs> Would you accept as me? No, but you know, just as some of you are CEOs, you know how it's difficult to be the leader, okay? You have to work too hard, to work very hard. Imagine the story. 
you are around the table with all the head of state. And then one said, okay, in the agenda today, we are going to decide who will be our chief. <laughs> you are chief, and you have to decide that. Just, you know, sorry, but uh, after the, it's, it's not only a joke, it's just to, to bring you to the psychological <laughs> dimension of the problem. When you talk with French citizens, with German citizens, I mean, I am not sure that they are all totally focused on the question of one European state. Let's talk about a German example. What is the main problem of the German opinion today? Is to say, are we going to pay for the one who are not yeah. working? Sorry huh, to be very pragmatic, but we all know that these discussions are not theoretical. We hear that everywhere. You see? Um, so, according to me, the main priority is not to break the discussion by saying federalism or nothing. I prefer bring the mentality to the idea that we can imagine for tomorrow uh, efficient public policies working with five countries, ten countries, eleven countries, and then to, to improve on this field. Then to say we don't do anything be before being 27. So we, it's better to have a sort of global strategy to say at the end of the day this is what we want to reach, but before that, let's try and to launch and launch and to implement some public policies. You see, okay, because well, of the burden of history. I think that uh, we have run out of time. You told me that we have to leave by two fifteen. So, in a good Insean tradition, actually, we have <laughs> over you. a lot of time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for coming here and sharing your views, and we we'll look forward to welcoming you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.